Hello friends, welcome to CEC live lectures. Dear friends, today in zoology, we will discuss about the concept of anemia and osteoporosis. In the first half of the lecture, we will discuss about anemia in that we will try to understand its causes, its pathology, significance, treatment and diagnosis. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert Dr. Amit Bhattacharya. Dr. Bhattacharya is assistant professor in the Department of Zoology in Ramjas College, University of Delhi. Without further ado, I would like to welcome sir to our studios and request him to start the lecture. Welcome, Thank you sir. very much. Ma'am. Good afternoon dear viewers. In this part of the lecture, I will be talking about anemia, what exactly anemia is, the pathogenesis. Then I will talk about what are the various physiological significance which happens in the anemia. And then I will talk about the diagnosis and the various treatment regimes which are available. So before going into the diagnosis and the treatment, we should know what exactly the anemia is. So anemia is basically when the, there is a lowering of the red blood cells or the red RBCs in our body or the amount or the content of the hemoglobins also decreases down. So that's called as the anemic condition. So anemia... Uh, by the WHO has been recognized as one of the most serious uh, health problems which have come across the uh, globe. So anemia is a condition in which the number of the red blood cells or their oxygen carrying capacity is insufficient to meet the physiological needs. So there are different uh, uh, ways by uh, due to which the anemic conditions occurs in which one of the most important is the iron deficiency. Then there are other conditions such as the folate, vitamin B12, vitamin A deficiency which also corresponds and causes anemia. There are different uh, uh, symptoms which are related to the anemia which includes the fatigueness, uh, weakness, dizziness, drowsiness and more, one of the most vulnerable age uh, uh, groups of the uh, persons are the pregnant women and the children who are most vulnerable to the anemic conditions. Now, about 30 to 40 percent of the population in the industrialized countries are basically suffering from the anemic conditions and uh, malaria also causes adds up to this anemic cases. Now, in the global uh, prevalence report in the 2011 by the WHO, it has been estimated that roughly about 43 percent of children, 38 percent of the pregnant women, 29% of the non-pregnant women and 29% of the women of reproductive age have anemia globally, which includes about 273 million children and 496 million non-pregnant women and 32 million pregnant women come under the anemic conditions. Now, there are different prevalence rates in the various WHO uh, countries accordingly. Now, if we see the graph over here, this is the global estimate of the prevalence of anemia in the infants and the child who are aged between 6 to 59 months. This is from the report uh, generated by the WHO in the year 2011. So, the brown area shows the largest uh, percentage of anemic conditions which are greater than or equal to 60%, while the red areas are showing the anemic cases which are between the 29, 20% to 40 percent. So we can see most of the large parts of the African regions are being affected by a huge percentage of the anemic conditions while in India uh, the general percentage is between 40 to 60 percent. Now if we see the global estimates of the prevalence of anemia in the pregnant women aged between 15 to 49 years uh, uh, as per as the report which has been published by the WHO in 2011 we can see the red areas are spread across the globe. So the red area shows the percentage cases which is between 20 to 40 percent cases while there are slight small patches of brown areas in the uh, African countries and most of the part of the India which constitutes about 40 to 60 percent anemic cases. So we can see how the anemia conditions are changing over the years. Now, anemia is basically a condition in which the number of red blood cells or the amount of hemoglobin, which is basically the protein that carries the oxygen in them, is low. So, in the image we can see the red blood cell which are shown over here. So, the quantity or the number of these red blood cells decreases down in the anemic conditions or there is a decrease of hemoglobin which is present within these red blood cells which decrease down. So, the red blood cells basically contains the hemoglobin. It is a protein that enable them to carry 
the oxygen from the lung and it delivers the oxygenated blood is then delivered to the various parts of the body. When the number of the red blood cells is reduced or the amount of the hemoglobin is lowered, then only what happens is the blood cannot carry an adequate supply of the oxygen and there is an oxygen scarcity which happens in the tissue. So this particular kind of conditions is called as anemia in which the person suffers from fatigueness, drowsiness, loss of weight. So there are lots of other conditions which are attached to this one. Now, if you see the picture over here, this picture shows how a red blood cell carries the oxygen from the lungs to the various parts of the body wherever the oxygen is required. And in return, uh, the, uh, the tissues, they release the carbon dioxide which is flown back into the lungs for subsequent oxidation process. So, the red blood cell transport the oxygen to the rest of the body through the process uh, of the red blood cell transfers. Now, there are different or the various types of anemia which are there. The first anemia is called as the iron deficiency anemia. It is mainly caused due to the shortage of the element iron in the body. So, the bone marrow uh, needs to make iron, needs iron to make hemoglobin. So, without the adequate presence of iron in the body, the bone marrow is unable to produce the hemoglobin for the red blood cells. And this type of anemia is basically caused by blood loss from heavy menstrual bleeding, ulcers, cancers and prolonged use of aspirin. So, iron deficiency anemia is one of the leading causes or the types of anemia which is spread across the globe. Now, the next type of the anemia is called as the vitamin deficiency anemia. Many a times it is referred as pernicious anemia. So, the body needs folate and vitamin B12 to produce sufficient amount of healthy red blood cells. The diet which lacks these particular uh, things like the folate and vitamin B12, it causes decrease in the red blood cell production and thus the person suffers from vitamin deficiency anemia. The third type of the anemia is called as the chronic anemia. Some of the chronic anemia diseases uh, are caused because of a number of diseases such as cancer, HIV, rheumatoid arthritis and other chronic inflammatory diseases. These diseases what they do is they interfere with the production of the red blood cells which causes a chronic anemia. The fourth type of the anemia is called as the aplastic anemia. This is basically a life threatening anemia which is caused by decrease in the bone marrow ability to produce the red blood cells. Bone marrow cells are, uh, bone marrows are the specialized cells which helps or provides the environment or the micro environment for the production of the red blood cells. So, the bone marrows are distorted or destroyed. What happens is there is a reduction in the production of the red blood cells and due to which the oxygen carrying capacity decreases down and the person suffers from various ailments. It is mainly caused due to infections, drugs and autoimmune diseases. The last type of the anemia which is called as the hemolytic anemia. This group of anemia develops when the red blood cells are destroyed faster than the red blood cells which are produced by the bone marrow. So the homeostasis between the production of the red blood cells and the destruction of the red blood cells is disrupted. So the red blood cells are disrupted because of the hemolytic conditions, they burst out and they cannot form a proper RBCs while the bone marrow cannot produce a sufficient amount of the red blood cells to compensate the uh, decreasing number of the red blood cells and the person suffers from the anemic conditions. This type of anemic conditions are called as the hemolytic anemia. So, certain blood diseases can cause increased red blood cell dis destructions uh, causing this hemolytic anemic conditions. Now, if we talk about the, uh, the risk factors of the anemia, there are various risk factors uh, which causes anemia. The few of the important ones are the diabetic conditions, then comes the hypertension, chronic uh, kidney disease because kidney produces one of the most important uh, uh, hormone erythropoietin which is required for the uh, synthesis or the production of the red blood cells in the bone marrow. So, if the kidneys are affected, the uh, red blood cells productions are uh, affected in a large number. 
then there are certain ethnic minorities group which uh, suffers from anemic condition then the cardiovascular diseases various cardiovascular diseases persons also suffer from certain anemic condition so these are the broad uh, risk factors for anemia now if we see the causes of anemia in the various who designated regions across the globe we can see one of the high importance uh, uh, causes of anemia is the iron deficiency which is highly prevalent in all the regions such as the sub saharan african south southeast asia region north africa Af americans region central asia western pacific so the, the iron deficiency is one of the leading cause of the anemia. Subsequently, the other causes of the anemia is the malaria infection because in the malaria, the parasite resides within the red blood cells while destroying the hemoglobin part of the red blood cells. So, malaria is also one of the most important uh, causes of anemic conditions. This malaria is one of the important uh, causes of anemia, especially in the sub Saharan uh, African region, while to a certain extent in the Southeast Asian regions and the Central Asia regions. While the other causes of the anemia are the hookworm infections, high fertility, HIV AIDS infections. So these are the various causes of anemia due to which the anemic occurs. Now, if we see the limits or uh, lower limits of the normal hemoglobin concentration, which is regarded as the safety limit by the WHO. So, the WHO has said that 13 gram per deciliter is the, uh, the uh, borderline for the men hemoglobin, while in the women, the, it is 12 uh, gram per deciliter. Now, if we see the grading of the anemia by the WHO, the hemoglobin contents have been graded into various bars. So, anything which is above 11 uh, hemoglobin, which is counted in the units gram per deciliter, it is regarded as the normal. Between 9.5 to 11, it is regarded as mild anemic conditions, while between 8 to 9.5, it is regarded as moderate while between a six and a half to eight it is regarded as serious anemic condition while below uh, six and a half hemoglobin it is regarded as the life-threatening anemic condition so we can see the gradation of anemia across the various parameters now uh, the hemogram or the blood pictures shows a complete image of what exactly is happening within our body. So, any doctor who uh, diagnosed the person with the anemic or certain other infectious or the disease condition, the first thing he recommends is go for a hemogram or a blood test. Now, this blood test helps the doctors to screen wide range of conditions and the diseases. Secondly, they help to monitor and effectiveness of treatment after a diagnosis is established. Third, it helps the doctor to diagnose various conditions such as anemia, infection, inflammation, bleeding disorders, leukemia, etc. Fourth, it monitors the treatment that is known to affect the blood cells such as the chemotherapy or the radiation therapy. So, a blood hemogram gives us a complete blood picture of what exactly is happening within our body. Now, in the blood hemogram, there are different definitions which are of importance. The first one is called as the hematocrit. The second one is the hemo, hemoglobin. The third one is the blood cells indices. And the fourth one is the reticulocyte count. We will come into them, each of them one by one. Now, as soon as the person goes into the lab, lab conditions, a blood sample is taken out from his arteries or the veins. Now, this blood is then centrifuged. So, what happens is if we see the image over here, the complete blood is taken out. Then when it is centrifuged, the red blood cell packed cells settles at the bottom. In the middle part, we get the white blood cells and the platelets and on the top, we get the plasma which basically contains the various proteins, hormones and the other parts. Now, these are then subsequently uh, given to the other test for subsequent results. Now, the plasma basically contains the water, protein, nutrients, hormones, etc. While the buffy coat or the white layer which is present between the plasma and the red blood cells 
basically contains the white blood cells and the platelets while the hematocrit is basically the red blood cell. So if we see the first test tube this is showing a normal blood count where the hemo, uh, hematocrit is present in a normal condition. While in the anemic conditions what happens is the hematocrit or the red blood cell count decreases down. So we can see the plasma amount increases while the red blood cell count decreases down. So this particular depression of hematocrit percentage is called as the anemic condition. Now there is another condition which is called as the polycythemia in which there is an elevated hematocrit concentration which happens. So we have seen in this picture there is an elevated level of the red blood cells which is there as compared to the normal blood test tubes and there is a decrease of the plasma uh, levels in the polycythemia cases. So these are the various conditions which can be compared with the normal blood samples. Now we come into each of the red cells indices one by one. Now the first one is called as the mean corpuscular volume. So this is basically the average volume of the red blood cells. This is calculated as the hematocrit divided by the red blood cells count into 10. So this is uh, expressed in the unit which is called as the femtoliter and the normal range is between 80 to 96 femtoliter. The second one, the major indices is called as the mean corpuscular hemoglobin. This is basically the average content of hemoglobin in average red blood cells. It is directly proportional to the amount of the hemoglobin and the RBC content. This is calculated uh, by the formula hemoglobin divided by the red blood cell count into 10 and the normal range is between 27 to 32 picogram. So this basically gives the average content of the hemoglobin in average red blood cells. The next indice is called as the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration MCHC. This is expressed the, as the average concentration of hemoglobin per unit volume of red blood cells or it is defined as the ratio of weight of hemoglobin to the volume of the red blood cells. This is calculated as the hemoglobin divided by the hematocrit count into 100 and the normal range is between 32 to 36 percent. Now one of the most important indices uh, over here is called as the reticulocyte count. So it is assumed that the normal red blood cells have got a lifespan of about 120 days. And the, that the duration of a reticulocytes in the peripheral blood is one day. So reticulocytes are basically the premature red blood cells which are released in the blood circulation. So reticulocyte at a random time will be about 0.8% uh, of all the red blood cells. The percentage of the reticulocyte in the peripheral blood indicates the rapidity of red cell turnover if the patient is in a steady state. So the number of reticulocyte released into the blood reflects the amount of erythropoiesis on a given day. So the reticulocyte uh, amount or the count is very important because it gives us an idea how well the erythropoiesis uh, is taking place. Erythropoiesis is basically the process where by which the red blood cells are produced. So erythro means red blood cells, poiesis means formation. So the process by which the red blood cells are formed, how well the process is being formed and how well our bone marrow cells are functioning. So a reticulocyte count gives us a very good idea about these processes. Now the reticulocyte count is usually uh, used to estimate the degree of effectiveness of the erythropoiesis processes. So in the male the normal range is between 0.8 to 2.5 percent while in the female it is between 0.8 to 4.1 percent. Now in the image over here which is shown with a raro we can see the reticulocytes which is shown over there. So these reticulocytes are counted and their percentage is taken out just to give us the estimate that how effective the erythropoiesis or the bone marrow cells are functioning in the production of the red blood cells. Now if we see the normal reference values of the various parameters, the red blood cells counts or the parameters in the female should be 4.8 while in the male it should be 5.4. The hemoglobin which is calculated in gram per deciliter 
in the female it should be 14 plus minus 2 while in the male it should be given as 16 plus minus 2. The hematocrit percentage in the female is uh, about 42 plus minus 5 while in the male it is 47 plus minus 5. So all these parameters gives us an idea how the red blood cells are produced and functioning in our body whether the person is suffering from any kind of infections and how the drugs are affecting the red blood cell production. Now there are different other parameters which are also normally referred which include the reticulocyte count which is between 0 0.2, 0 0.5 to 2.5% while MCV uh, mean corpuscular volume which should be 90 plus minus 7 fermoliter then MCH uh, which is between 29 plus minus 2 picogram MCHC which is 34 plus minus 2 and RWD which is 11.5 to 14.5 percent. So all these references gives us an idea how well the body is functioning. Now if we come to the symptoms of anemia, there are different various symptoms of anemia which are there which includes the tiredness, weakness, pale skin, irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, chest pain, dizziness, cold, hand and feet, headache. So these are all the anemic symptoms which are related to these ones. Now about the treatment of the anemia, uh, one of the most uh, important anemia which is found globally it is called as the iron deficiency anemia. So in this form the diets are changed and the doctor prescribe iron supplement so that the iron deficiency in the loss of the blood can be compensated. Then comes the vitamin deficiency anemia in which the virus various vitamins such as the folic acid and vitamin C deficiency occurs. So the doctor prescribes dietary supplements and increases the nutrients in the diet so that the vitamin B12 and the food vitamins can be uh, given. So there are injections and there are tablets which are available. Then there are anemia of chronic infections which occurs because of the side effects of the various drugs. Then there are aplastic anemia, the treatment for the anemia mainly includes blood transfusion to boost the level of uh, red blood cells because in this particular kind of anemia the bone marrow is diseased and it cannot function properly to produce sufficient quantity of the red blood cells. Then there is hemolytic anemia which depends upon the severity of the anemia, a blood transfusions of the or the plasma pheresis is done. It is basically a type of blood filtering process which occurs. So the dead red blood cells are taken out from the body and this is one of the most important hemolytic anemia which is life threatening type of anemic condition. So with this note I come to the end of my lecture. In this part of the lecture I discussed about what exactly the anemia is and how we can interpret the blood report results with the help of the various parameters what are the diagnoses which are available and the treatment regimes which are available for the various types of the anemia. So I come to the end of my note. Thank you very much. Dear friends, in this lecture, anemia and osteoporosis, so far we have discussed about anemia and its symptoms, its, uh, its uh, treatment, significance and diagnosis. On that note, we're going to take a break and after the break, we will be resuming with the lecture. Thank you for watching.
Jones. Hello friends, welcome to CEC live lectures. Dear friends, in this lecture on anemia and osteoporosis, in this part of the lecture we will discuss about osteoporosis. In this lecture we will discuss its symptoms, what, what osteoporosis is, its pathology, significance, treatment and diagnosis. To discuss this topic we have with us a subject expert Dr. Amit Bhattacharya and let's welcome Dr. Bhattacharya and ask him to resume the lecture. Welcome Thank sir. you very much ma'am. So, uh, in this part of the lecture, I will talk about the osteoporosis, another one of the most important diseases which is affecting especially the persons of higher age groups. So, before going into the various diagnosis and the pathology of the osteoporosis, we should know what exactly the osteoporosis means. So, the word osteoporosis basically means the porous bones. So, what happens in the osteoporosis is the bone which are made up of mesh like networks of the calcium or the various minerals they get degraded from the body and subsequently the bone mesh decreases becomes thin and uh, it tends to uh, break down easily so basically the osteoporosis occurs when the bones uh, within the bones the uh, mesh like things becomes thin causing the bones to become fragile and they break easily often forming a uh, bump or the fall now these broken bones are often referred as the fragility fractures many a time so we will come into the them one by one so uh, uh, the uh, if we see uh, the nutshell of the life so the life is basically a series of transitions so if you see the image over here the life is basically a series of uh, transition in which at the various stages or the ages what happens is there is a formations of the bone or the regeneration and subsequently at the later part of the age there is degradation or chewing up of the bone so in the first part of the life basically the ossification which is the formation of the bones takes place which is much higher than the deossification while when we reach the maturity stage the ossification and the deossification processes both are equal to one another so there is a homeostatic condition while at the later part of the age there is a deossification process which is much higher than the ossification processes so there is a transition or the series of transitions which occurs at the various parts of the ages now the osteoporosis is basically which literally means the porous bones and it is many a times referred as the fragile bone disorders or the disease so we can see a bone image which is shown over here the bone if we see the bone uh, in the uh, graphs electron micrographs we can see these osteons or the bone cells which are formed by the various mesh like uh, thing so these basically contains a high quantity of the calcium and the various minerals into it now over the years what happens is as the body requirement for these increases up and there is a less intake of these through the dietary intakes so what happens is they, these get degraded from the bones and subsequently the person gets into the osteoporotic conditions now before going into what exactly the pathology of osteoporosis is we should know the epidemiology and how the cases across the globes are changing so this is a graph which is showing the projected number of osteoporosis fractures worldwide so it has been seen that the total number of hip fractures in the year 1950 was about 14 the 1433 million cases 
while it is projected or uh, suspected that this will increase to about 5,395 million cases in the 2050. So we can see how the number of cases of osteoporosis is increasing. Now, if we see the uh, graphical representation over here, the blue graph shows the number of cases in the 1990s, while the green graph shows the cases which will have projected in the 2050. So we can see there is a surge of these cases across the year. So we can just see how the osteoporosis cases are increasing over the years globally. Now, if we see the scenario of the osteoporosis in India, in the India, about 26 million Indians suffers from osteoporosis and this number is expected to reach about 36 million by 2013. So, it has been projected that how the number of cases are increasing. So, if we see the graph over here, this graph is a projection which is shown uh, the number of cases in the women and the men. So, we can see the women cases are increasing much higher rate than the men cases. We will come into the points that why the woman suffers from much more osteoporotic conditions than the male cases. Now, the bones, uh, before going into the osteoporosis, we should know what exactly the bone cells are made up of and what the bones are. So, bones are basically a number of uh, units of cells which are referred as the osteons. Now, these osteons uh, together they form the bone cells. Now, these osteons are supplied with the various nutrients and the food material with the help of the vessels, veins and the nerves. So, they are being regulated with the help of the blood vessels, veins and the nerves. Now, these osteons are made up of osteocytes and the various other cells. Now, these osteocytes are basically the mature bone cells which are spider shaped and maintain the bone tissue. Apart from the osteocytes, there is a presence of two other main kind of cells which are called as the osteoblast and the other one are called as the osteoclast. Now the osteoblast are basically the bone generating cells. So the B in the osteoblast stands for the building things while in the osteoclast which are basically bone destroying cells, the C means the chewing up of the cell. Now, if we see the picture over here, the stained picture of the bone cells, we can see the osteoblast cells which are thin and elongated cells while we can see the other cells which are called as the osteoclasts which are big cells which are basically responsible for the bone destruction or the destroying cell while the osteocytes which are basically for maintenance of the bone tissues can be also seen. So, the bones are majorly made up of these three main cells, the osteoblast, osteocytes and the osteoclasts. Now, the bones are composed of two major elements, the minerals which includes basically the calcium and the phosphorus and the bone cells which contains the osteoblast, osteoclasts and osteocytes, the cells which are responsible for the maintenance of the bone cells. Now, a healthy bone mass is basically dependent upon the ratio or the percentage of the bone formation which is majorly done by the osteoblast cells while the bone reabsorption or the bone degradation which play, takes place with the help of the osteoclast. So, whenever there is a proper homeostasis bit or a the static condition which occurs between the bone cell formation and the bone reabsorption, the bone mass is said to be normal or healthy bone mass is there. Now, how exactly the bone reabsorption takes place? So, the bone reabsorption or the regeneration processes is a constant process which occurs. Now, basically what happens is as the bones are formed, so there is a formation of the bones which takes place with the help of the osteoblast cells. Now, these bones continues to regenerate long after we reach our full height also. Now, initially the calcium supplies are at a much higher rate, so the bone formations takes place. Now, subsequently when the calcium and the other mineral quantities decreases down in the things, so these calciums or the storage stored minerals which are stored in the bones are degraded or reabsorbed into the body. Now, the next level of the cells comes into the picture which are called as the osteoclast which 
dissolves the old bones and subsequently this regeneration of formation and the degradation process takes place hand in hand. So, the bone regeneration process is a uh, regeneration process which helps the bone to regenerate to replace the old bones and subsequent stronger and new bones are formed in place. Now, let us come into the function of the two most important cells in the bone cells which are called as the osteoblast cells and the other one are called as the osteoclast cells. Now, the osteoblast cells are the cells that built bones while they, they produce the collagen which is basically the reinforcing rods of the bones. Then to this collagen coat there is a protein which is attached which is called as the glue protein that holds the calcium in place. So, the calcium from the blood streams then automatically adheres to this collagen forming new bones. So, this is how the osteoblast cells function. Now, in the case of the osteoclast cells what happens is osteoclast cells that dissolves bone they start out as a type of blood cells but are transformed into osteoclasts within our bones through the action of hormone. Now, the osteoclast cells use acid or enzymes to dissolve the calcium and the collagen from the old bones. This dissolved calcium then re-enters the bloodstream and is carried to different parts of the body. Now, the osteoclasts are basically it dissolves the calcium from the bones and with the help of the blood circulation, the blood is then transferred, uh, the calcium is then transferred into the blood circulation or the blood stream which then goes into the various parts of the body where the calcium is required. So, the main cause of the osteoporosis is said to be calcium deficiency which damages which uh, and the damage caused by overactive osteoclast cell. So, suppressing the excessive activity osteoclast is therefore a vital importance for the uh, stopping of the osteoporosis process. So, the osteoclast cells plays a very important role in the bone reabsorption and stopping their function plays a very important role apart from the calcium deficiency which occurs in our body. Now, if we see the image over here, this image shows the bone regeneration which takes place in our body. Now, the osteoclast cells are carried via the blood streams into the bones. These, these osteoclast cells, they firmly attach themselves to the bone and whenever this body requires calcium, what these cells does is they release certain acids and the enzyme that dissolves the bone. So, there is a calcium reabsorption takes place with the, the from this bone. So, we can see the bone has been distorted or has been destroyed. Now, subsequently the osteoblast cells comes into the pictures for the regeneration processes. These cells produces a collagen layer or the core onto the top of these damaged parts and then to these ones the calcium which is present in the blood streams get attached and the new bones tissues are formed over here. So, there is a constant functioning of the osteoclast and the osteoblast cells within our body. So, as to compensate the formations of the new bones structure. Now, if we see the bone structure by age, the bone structure by the age varies accordingly. So, in the initial phase which is called as basically the growth period, uh, the bone development takes place. So, in this growth period what happens is the bone formation which is called as the ossification is much higher than the bone destruction which is called as the deossification. Now, in the growth period there is an increased metabolism during the growth period which means that the bones are rapidly being formed and dissolved. And during this growth period, there is large uptake of the calcium. So, the bones also tend to increase or form new limb. But because the bone formation is much pronoun more pronounced at this stage, the bone continues to grow larger. During this period, the food and the exercise are vital to the growth and the development. The bone mass is said to increase until approximately 20 in the backbone and until 30 in the arms and the legs. So, we can see the growth age tends to go till the age of 30 where the bone formation or the ossification process is in a much higher rate than the deossification which is basically the bone destruction process. 
Now, the next phase which comes is called as the maturity phase where the ossification and the deossification process are uh, in contrast to one another or they equal one another. So, this is basically the phase where the bone formation and the bone reabsorption takes equally. So, there is a compensation which occurs. So, by the time uh, we reach our 30s, our bones are fully formed and our bone mass is at the peak. It is the period, uh, the maturity period is the period when the bone formation and the bone destruction are in balance. At this time of the life, a balanced diet is more important to delay the onset of a future decrease in the bone mass. So, we can see the image over here, the ossification which is shown by the blue dot and the deossification which is shown in the orange dot, they are equal to one another. So, the bone formation and the bone destruction or the reabsorption are equal to one another. The next one comes is called as the aging process which basically comes at the later part of the age. So, from the 40 onwards, the bone mass enters a gradual decline. So, in the aging process, what happens is the bone destruction or the deossification process is much higher than the bone formation or the ossification process. Now, in this particular thing, the bone formation is much weaker than the bone destruction. Bone destruction takes over the bone formation process. These, uh, these situations are ba basically dangerous level where the osteoporosis tends to set in and these are basically very dangerous conditions for the uh, bone uh, mass reduction and possibly leads to certain kinds of fractures which occurs at the later part, part of the ages. Now, if we see the graph over here, the graph shows how exactly the relative bone mass varies according to the various age groups. So, at the initial part of the age from 0 to 30 years, we can see the ossification process or the bone formation process is much higher than the bone degradation process or the deossification process. So, the graph tend to increase down, then it reaches a plateau where the bone formation and the bone reabsorption processes are equal to one another while after a certain point or 50 years of age and in the menopause woman what happens is the osteoporosis level tends to increase. So, now in this particular phase what happens is the deossification levels increases much higher than the formation bone formation or the ossification processes. So, the graph over here tends to show the relative bone mass as compared to the age masses and the red dotted line is showing the typical bone mass curve while the blue line is showing the ideal bone mass curve how it should be. So, with this the doctor compares the bone mass of the various patients who report with the cases of osteoporosis. Now, the question which comes easily is why osteoporosis is more common among the women. Now, the osteoporosis is more common in the women because the women tend to have smaller bone structure and lower bone, total bone de density or mass than the men. Another one of the most important influence is of the female hormone estrogen. Now, the estrogen works to inhibit the bone destroying function of the osteoclast cells. We have learned that the osteoclast cells are the cells which occurs or helps in the bone reabsorption or degradation. Now, the estrogen hormone what happens is they inhibit this osteoclast cells. But as the woman reaches the menopause age, what happens is the levels of the estrogen decreases down. So, the inhibitory effect on the osteoclast cell decreases and the osteoclast cells becomes active and they chew up the bone or degrade the bone and subsequently the uh, woman after a certain age group starts suffering from the problem of osteoporosis. So, osteoporosis is much more common in the woman than in the main cases. Now, the osteoporosis, one of the most important uh, consequence of the osteoporosis is the fractures which are many a times very painful. So, the osteoporosis uh, because the bones tend to become very fragile, thin, so they can go into the cases of uh, fracture cases. Now, 
we'll see some of the most important fractures which occurs because of the osteoporosis. Now, one of the most important fractures which is reported in the osteoporotic condition is the hip fracture. So, these osteoporotic fractures are most commonly reported in the late 70s and the 80 age group cases. Now, over here we can see a hip bone and majorly this fractures occurs at the intracapsular and the extracapsular regions in the femur bone. So, we can see the neck of the femur which tends to break down from the pel pelvis over here and this is one of the most important and the large number of cases which are reported from the osteoporosis which are of hip fracture. So, we can see over here how this uh, fractures occur. So, when a person suffers from such fractures, there are certain operations which are done and subsequently with the help of the medications and the physiotherapy and the social care, the person gets back to his proper lifestyles. Now, the most second important fractures which occurs because of the osteoporosis is the spinal fractures. So, the fractures due to the osteoporosis of the bones in the spines which are many times referred as the vertebrae usually occurs in the lumbar which is basically the lower or the thoracic middle area of the spine. They are many a times referred as the spinal or vertebral fracture in which the bone becomes squashed or compressed because of their reduced strength. So, sometimes they are referred as crushed, collaged or wedged depending upon how the bone is affected, a compression fracture uh, is a good way of describing what happens. So, we can see over here the image which is shown over here the various fracture conditions. So, we can see a normal vertebrae which is shown at the bottom while the other osteoporosis which occurs which forms the vertebrae into causing them into occur into a biconcave structure. Then comes the wedge fractures where the uh, the vertebrae tends to collapse or they tends to get crushed because of this, these particular fractures. Now, apart from these uh, fractures, there are various other fractures which occurs in the osteoporosis which includes the wrist fracture. Uh, uh, the broken wrist fracture is another one of the most important indications that the person is suffering from the osteoporosis. It often occurs in the middle aged woman who have to put their arms to break uh, at the fall. Healthy bones should be able to withstand a fall but a person who is suffering from the osteoporosis uh, tends to uh, get the wrist fractures. The other bones which are susceptible to the fractures because of the osteoporosis are the humerus, ribs and the pelvis fractures which are very common because they are fragile uh, and they tend to get into a osteoporotic uh, fracture condition. Now, there are various scans and the tests which are available for scanning these osteoporotic conditions. We will come into each of them one by one what exactly tests are available over here. Now, the, the first and the foremost thing which the doctor does when a fracture cases are reported he, uh, he or she uh, reports the patient to go for a normal x-ray. So, the normal x-rays are basically help to see whether the what exactly bone has been broken on. Majorly in the osteoporosis, it is hip bone, wrist bone or the some other bones of the body. So, the height loss, uh, spinal curvature are not always caused by osteoporotic fractures. So, a normal x-ray can be useful for the identification of other problems such as the disc infection diseases also. So, the first thing which the doctor does is the normal x-ray. Subsequently, there are different bone densitometry scans which are basically the scans which helps the doctor to verify how much the bone density or the bone mass is present in the patients over here. Now, one of the most important scans which is there, it is called as the DXA scan which is dual energy x-ray scan which is being done. It is regarded as the golded gold standard scans over here which is reported in the patient. There are various techniques which are there in the scans. One of them is called as the peripheral DXA scans, then the QCT which is quantitative computed tomography and the ultrasound which is another scan which helps to uh, designate what is the bone density, density scans which are there. Subsequently, there are various blood tests which are available because in the blood there are various bone 
markers which are present so these bone markers start coming up in the urine and the blood as the patient suffers from the osteoporotic conditions so what happens is the these blood test helps to check the levels of these uh, uh, bone markers present within the blood circulations or the blood levels now if we see uh, the bone uh, density scan what exactly the bone density scan is so the bone density scan is basically many a times referred as the dual energy x-ray absorptometry scan or the dx scan this is basically a bone density metry scan in this the it is a simple and painless procedure which is done where a low doses of radiations are given in this the patients uh, the area where the scans has to be done, the patients is asked to lie down for about 10 to 15 minutes where the X-ray scanner message scans the body part uh, for which the uh, bone densitometry have to be scanned upon and subsequently what it does is uh, it compares the results with the normal patients of the same age group and the same sex and it gives you a units of how exactly your uh, data are varying above or the below the average for the population so the bone densitometry uh, levels are being changed and they have been given up by the who so a t score test is uh, uh, which is taken out in the bone densitometry report it shows that how much your bone mass varies or deviates from the bone mass of a average healthy person of that particular age and sex so the score of the bone mineral density which is the bmd or dexa test is measured as the standard deviation from the mean it is being said that the dxa uh, level or the bmd level if it is between plus 4 to minus 1 it is regarded as the normal level of the bone densito uh, densito scans while if the level comes between minus 1 to minus 2.5 then the there is a low bone density which is many a time these conditions are referred as osteopenia if the conditions are below 2. Point, minus 2.5 till minus 4 the person is said to suffer from osteoporosis which is the um, the most important form of the osteoporosis where the porous bones can lead to various kind of fractures so the t score test in the bone density reports is one of the most important or the critical part of these bone density scans which gives us an idea that how exactly our bone mass is varying from the normal levels across the healthy individuals now if we see the image over here this image shows that how exactly the bone densitometry scans or the t score test levels are being scanned so each part of the body where exactly the bone densitometry test has to be done is scanned with the help of the dxa machine then the t score scans are being done and the t score test uh, values comes up so these t score values gives us an idea that how the normal levels are so the green levels are basically showing the normal levels while the red levels are if the uh, number comes in the red marked level it shows that the person is suffering from the osteoporosis and in between there is a condition which is called as the osteopenia where the number of uh, the person chances is he, he or she is going into the osteoporotic condition and the various particular treatment regimes are available over there. Now if we come into the various drug treatments which are available for the osteoporosis there are various drugs which are there so uh, basically the drugs are the one which slows down the activity of the osteoclast cells the osteoclast cells are the cells basically which are responsible for the bone reabsorption or the bone degradation so there are various osteoblast cells osteoclast cells which uh, breakdowns so there is a anti responsive drugs which are available these treatments are basically it stimulates the cells which builds up the new bones especially the osteoblast cells over here and there are uh, many drugs which are referred as the anabolic drugs where, so there is a combination of these both these drugs are given to the patients uh, so that the degradation of the bone reabsorption processes tends to decrease down and subsequently there are various uh, supplements the calcium and the mineral supplements which are given along with the dietary uh, charts so that the calcium levels can increase down 
Now, uh, the few of the most important drugs are the bisphosphonate drugs, which includes the alendronate and the other drugs. So, uh, with this part, I come to the end of my lecture over here. Now, in this part, I have discussed about what exactly osteoporosis, the function of the various bone cells, especially the osteoclast, osteoblast, and the osteocyte cells. And then I have come into how exactly these levels vary between the various age groups. And then I have discussed about the scans which are available and the drugs which are available for the osteoporosis over here. So with this note, I come to the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. Dear friends, in this lecture on anemia and osteoporosis, we have discussed about the symptoms, the uh, pathology significance and diagnosis of both the diseases. On that note, we would like to thank Dr. Bhattacharya for coming here and thank delivering you. this wonderful lecture. And thank you, dear friends, for watching our lecture. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you. Thank you.